My name is Taika Adiri, your regular and co of the Trade Talks podcast. Today on the show, I have Dr. Bamidili Adibo, also known as Export Doctor, and he's here to answer a couple of questions that I'm sure you have, you've had on your mind for a couple of times. So let's just dive right into it. Okay. So I have a couple of questions here for you. Mm-hmm. First one is, what impact, this is a follow-up to our previous episode actually. Okay, yes. to the previous episode we have. So uh, what impact do global supply chain disruptions like pandemics or ge- geopolitical tensions have on international trade and how can businesses prepare for them? No, you know, international trade is likely a business of logistics. Business of logistics. And that question, let me tell you what happened during COVID. During COVID, a lot of factory produced goods, the goods were in the warehouse, they could not be moved. Because they could not be moved, it affected, of course, disruption, affect a lot of other um, supply chains. So, for example, a good example is you look at look at how integrated global supply chain is. Lead oil is produced somewhere in Ishiago in a burning state. This lead oil is shipped by sea to China. China converts this lead oil to lead ingot. The lead ingot is shipped from China to Germany. Germany converts this lead ingot to battery. The battery is shipped from Germany to the US. US put the battery inside the Ford motor. The Ford motor comes into Nigeria. You can see many continents involved in the global supply chain. It's an intercontinental supply chain, meaning we are so interdependent now and day such that whatever affects one affects all. That is the challenge. So when there's a disruption, it, ha- it has a ripple effect on many other things because of the way, uh, because it, it actually makes the world trade more efficient when you have that interconnectivity among businesses around the world. Now, for pandemic, for example, there was a big challenge because there was lockdown, so much uh, uh, product, manufacture, raw material stored, and now need to be moved. Look at what some company did. A company like China paid shipping line. They have shipping line already, and also form an alliance and agreement with the shipping line such that because they have so many things in China, when they come into Nigeria, they don't want to pick up anything. They will pick up only empties and go back to China. That saves time because they go straight to China rather than going, stopping at a different port and moving. They go back straight to China. When they get to China, they will load those containers, they will drop those containers, load the one that will be loaded, and then move again. And what that is doing is injuring other African countries that have good to ship being affected. And that became a big challenge during COVID, such that I had a shipment from Nigeria to Canada. That should take less than six weeks. It took over three months for the container to move from Nigeria. It got to Morocco. Morocco was where there was big issue because all the vessels coming to pick it up were filled up. They were filled up. They were filled up. And for many months, we ship in January. The buyer did I say three months? It's more than three months. We ship in January. The buyer not get until around May. It was such a disaster. I think some of the product inside were already expiring when they had arrived. It was a loss, actually, because they actually had to destroy some of those products. Now, what is that saying? That is the challenge of disruption. Now, how do we fix this? Number one, immediately you see that kind of issue happen, which was a mistake I believe we made. Number one is to confirm, if you are going to book any ship at that time, is it going straight or there will be transshipment? Immediately, you know there will be transshipment. You know transshipment means there will be delay. You shouldn't allow transshipment because transshipment makes shipping line more efficient. But sometimes some vessel will go straight. There won't be transshipment. Now, sorry, transshipment means they will load the goods from one container to one vessel to the other. But even though the, the shipping line can go to different ports to pick up container, but as long as that wood will not be loaded into another vessel. Because what that means is that if there's wood loaded into another vessel, if the vessel have now arrived, they will drop it in that port, waiting for that vessel to come in. And that was what happened to us in Morocco. Because we could track. So we could see it still in Morocco port until eventually it was picked up. So one of the ways to build resilience is number one, is number one to understand the supply chain, or be able to project and see what is happening, to be able to foresee what will happen because of what is happening. That's why you hear news, particularly news that affect, like there was time UTs where 
were attacking sheep somewhere in the Red Sea because any vessel going to Israel or any vessel owned by Israel allied, they were attacking it. And that is making vessels that are supposed to pass through Red Sea, Suez Canal to enter Europe, we now have to go and pass through Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, down to go to Europe. That's a longer route, increasing the cost by about 40%. Now, I should be aware of those things. I should be very much up to date with what is going on and look at it. How does it affect my business and my shipment and be able to take a decision based on that? If I don't do that, then I can be caught in the web, like the case I told you about. So I need to be aware of what is going on with the news. I need to be able to ensure that uh, I have options at every point in time. So when I want to ship, I'm negotiating with different shipping lines, not just their rate and cost. I'm also asking them the transit time, but more importantly, whether there will be transshipment or not. When there's transshipment, it's always cheaper, although it's longer. It's just like we are traveling to U UK. And or you are traveling to US. You know this world. I've not done this one before. Those people doing it, I don't know how they are doing it. We are traveling to US. We are using Qatar. They will take you to Doha first. About six, seven hours before they will not start going. They might even stop on the way to be able to refer because of the distance from Middle East down rather than moving 12 hours from Nigeria to Atlanta. So the idea is this: the fact that it's a longer journey, but it might be cheaper. You now have to ask yourself. Do you want it faster or you want it cheaper? To be able to decide. But my recommendation would be for you to confirm from the shipping line what is the route because they already planned the route. What is the route of the shipping line to the destination and be able to decide if it works for you. If it doesn't, then you have to go for another option, which is why you have to negotiate with different shipping lines, go to that destination. But as much as possible, I would strongly recommend you avoid any form of transshipment for that shipment. And that's I mean, to be able to, and of course, monitor the news to be able to know which vessel will be most appropriate for the timeline you are looking for for that shipment uh, to be able to get it back to the destination. What is the role of technology or technological softwares in streamlining logistics? Um, there are different applications now that can help you manage your logistics, both in the local. Now, for the international, you really don't. Um, you really don't, um, I'm not sure you really, the technology you need is the tracking with the shipping line already have. Um, now, if you, are, if you have an app that manages your logistics and movement of good to destination, and what you might now need is for that app to have a module or section that you can add information you are getting about transit time from other shipping line or from other uh, from other shipping line in terms of the movement of the goods and container to be able for your own app to be able to now give you a holistic view of this how to plan this shipment so for example i have a timeline of when this woman get to destination now i have a timeline of my own movement i put it on my app and i've now put for shipping line a shipping company A, B, C, D, based on their transit time, based on their the port they are going to be visiting and destination, and then the app public will be able to give me a good picture of which of the shipping lines should I choose based on the information I provided from that shipping line, unless my app is plugged into it. If not, but I am aware also that now there are apps available online for global logistics, such that if I put in the detail of my shipment. And the detail of the shipping line, because they already plugged into that shipping line, they will be able to give me that kind of information. So I would rather you don't even do develop app yourself, rather go on those third party app, pay them, put in your information, they can plug it into other shipping line and be able to make recommendation for you on the most appropriate shipping line to use for the destination. Those kind of app already exist. I'm very much aware of that already exist for different uh, by different companies uh, in Europe and America. Um, what are the most common causes of delay in cross-border shipping, and how can businesses minimize them? One of the major causes of delay is um, documentation. Documentation. In that trade, is largely a business of logistics and documentation. For my good to leave Nigeria, there are documents that I must provide to customs, NDNDA, SSS, pre shipment inspection agent, the banks. Uh, NAVDAC, if you're regulated by NAVDAC, uh, MPA, 
all those documents must be ready and they must not have discrepancies, particularly for the banks. In fact, in fact, if I'm using a bank, the delay can happen if now the delay in this case now will not mean delay on shipment, like the question you asked, it will be delay in payment. In fact, it, it will be not just delay in payment, delay in clearing. Because if my document have discrepancy, inconsistency in the information of the document, and I give it to the bank in Nigeria, and the good go to China, when the good arrive in China, and the document sent to the bank in China, the bank in China is going to check this document. If there is a discrepancy of that document, the bank in China is going to hold on to the document, contact my bank to contact me to make necessary correction or accept discrepancy. And if I'm going to make that correction, the good might have arrived in China, particularly if I'm shipping, let's say I'm shipping to the UK, where, where you arrive in three weeks. The good might have arrived and then I have delay because they will not release that document to the buyer to collect the goods until I've corrected the issue because that was also, it's also needed for them to be able to pay. Until I corrected the issue, that will also be needed for them to be able to pay for the goods. Uh, uh, so to be able to pay for the goods. So, Documentation, I think, is a major issue. Apart from delay, that could be logistics, maybe planning on the part of shipping line. Congestion, in the case of Nigeria, when there's congestion at the port, the vessel have arrived, but the vessel cannot bet because there's no space, because there's congestion. There's other ship waiting because they are not able to move container out on time, and then they could not unload from the container to put it where they are supposed to. Because when they unload, they put it in a place where they now move to the permanent location. If, they, if the pandemic is congested and this place is congested, if you don't move it out of the quay or the uh, the platform beside where they unload the container, that becomes a challenge for that ship. That ship will not live on time. And this is the painful thing. They will not transfer the cost. Ex any extra cost they incur. They tra yes, they transfer it to every exporter that wants to ship on that ship. She will pay the, you pay the fee. Because... Hmm? Is that going to reduce congestion at the port? No, they are, they, I mean, for Lagos now, it has been reduced. But I'm just giving an example of what could cause the delay. So documentation could be an issue. Uh, the, there's discrepancy on document, congestion. It can also be because inefficiency on the part of the exporter itself. In his plan, planning, planning your shipment. Planning your shipment. If I'm targeting a vessel, if I'm targeting a vessel that we are currently in uh, 20, 20, 24th of uh, October, and we're doing this recording, if I'm targeting a vessel in, that will come in on the if I want to ship this month, my good need to arrive at the port at least five days, three to five days before the good arrive, before the vessel arrive. So that means if I don't plan myself very well, a vessel coming on the 31st, my good should be at the port latest, 27, in some cases, 28. If I'm not efficient in my planning for whatever reason, and I delay arrival, then it will delay that shipment also because they will now have to replan that good on another vessel coming in. We might be in another one week or two weeks. Okay. So how can businesses ensure compliance with local and national regulations when transporting One of the major ways you know, one of the major ways to comply is to know. And to know, you need to learn, which is why we do mentoring program, coaching program, training program. It's unfortunate some people just want to put the container inside, the, uh, uh, buy the goods, put it in the container and do the shipment. Because many don't know the fact that the more border you are crossing, the more complicated the documentation is, which is the why, the challenge of moving by road in West Africa. So you need to, first of all, know if I'm, number one, know that if I'm shipping, my, I, I will need to do a lot of documentation. The documentation I'm going to do is going to depend, depend on the country I'm doing the shipment to. That, that was what is that mean the documentation I'm going to do. So I now have to learn. So for example, if I'm shipping to a particular country, if I'm shipping to a particular country, look at what often happens. The buyer and seller will sign an agreement. That agreement is supposed to indicate what are the documents the buyer requires from me to ship the goods. Because that buyer needs the document at destination. So if the buyer does not put that document, it will be a challenge. That's why if I'm an expert and I'm exporting for the first time, I need to be sure the buyer is not important for the first time. If it's important for the first time, he might not put it in. So if you're working with your brother and sister abroad and you're shipping to yourself, you might have issues. Because it's not likely you're going to put on the document, on the contract, the document the exporter needs to provide. But if I'm an expert and I'm talking, I'm shipping to a regular importer who is being important. He's able to put there. 
if you are shipping to this country, you put the food bill of lading for all shipments. There will be bill of lading or airway bill if the last transfer document. There will be invoice and there will be parking for many shipments. But in addition to that, some country will ask for bill of, for certificate of origin. Some country will ask you for five cents certificate if it's plant uh, plant based product. Some country will ask you for fumigation certificate. Some country will ask you for hassle. Hazard analysis and critical control point certification. So we will ask you for FGS third party inspection of quality and quantity. Some country country will ask you for organic certification. Some country will ask you for IS certification. Whatever certification they are asking for, if possible, I'm able to get it. But I must first of all know what those certifications are. So if I want to know about the regulation, attend regular um, training programs, talk to people who are already doing it, get all the information you can you need. And ensure all the documents required by the buyer are stated in the contract so that you don't ship the good at guest destination and they are unable to clear on time because you don't have the document. Now you have to get the document. We might take it by a week or two. The guy is incurring demolish, he's going to transfer that cost to you. Okay. Um, so what's the role of freight forwarders and when is the business continuing? Either you are shipping by air or by sea, you need a freight forwarder. Freight forwarder are companies that arrange goods for shipment to international destination. They are rain goods for shipment and high destination. My opinion is that you should not leave the documentation, the sh declaration to, sh to, to the government with NXP or for them if it's an import. You should not leave critical area of your transaction in the hand of the forwarder. Why? If the forwarder mess up, if the forwarder mess up, you are the one that will bear the cost because your goods. If you don't pay whatever issue he has created, you will bear the cost. So you will bear the loss because it's your goods. So it's important, number one, you need a free forwarder, but you need a registered free forwarder, a competent free forwarder who knows what he's doing. But you must do, so for example, let me use a particular example. We are expanding from Nigeria. My declaration to government will do it ourselves. The booking of shipping, shipping line and container will do it ourselves. The uh, processing of inspection by inspection agent will do it ourselves. The way we will engage forward is going to get all the agency of government arranging their logistics and bringing them to the point where they come to do inspection. Those we are going to have to do ourselves. The forwarder we have to do. Because we don't know those people. So the forwarder we have to do those. And because we are not a licensed custom agent. So the agent is the only one that can talk to custom and the client through custom talk to other agencies to come and do inspection. And then do all the documentation with those agencies. But you see those initial preparation of opening NXP, uh, doing the booking of truck, booking for container, uh, booking the shipment, payment of freight, we have to do it ourselves. The one we can do, we have to engage forwarder. And we engage forwarder that have a track record of performance, refer forwarder that can be traced, refer forwarder that know what he's doing, refer forwarder that will be able to deliver on what is expected. So I should not leave the, the, the success of my transaction 100% in the hand of refer forwarder. I should do it myself, at least a good chunk of it, which can be up to 20 or 30 percent of what is required. Okay. So, how can businesses assess and select the best logistics providers for their international shipments? Credibility, credibility, credibility. Evidence of what they have done before. Who have they done it for? Who are the people they have worked with and they have spoken to? So, if I'm, I'm going to talk to one or two people you have spoken, you have worked with, evidence of what you have done in the past. And because I know what I want, I'm going to ask you a question that shows you know. So if I know what I want, I will be able to spot the right forwarder because I'm going to ask him questions about income, ask him questions about documentation, ask him questions about the export process in general. And his responses will show if he even know what he's saying in the first place. And for those that are listening to us, if you are from Nigeria, Nigerian um, clearing and forwarding or custom brokers, we call it some quarters, they are more. They are very good with import because I get a lot of import, but they are not very good with export. Not all of them can do export very well. So you need to ask the right question and ensure that this person knows exactly what he's doing. And, and just asking questions, checking them out, getting feedbacks or, 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 or testimonial from people they have worked with. We have to be able to choose the right freight forwarder uh, for your shipment to the international uh, destination. Okay, so how important is packaging and ensuring goods are delivered safely during international transit? And what are best practices for packaging goods for export? You know, this, um, you know that some goods actually get damaged in transit because of this question. 
some good because they are not well packaged. Let me give you a good example. There was a case some time ago. Someone was importing no, 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 no. fish head. It's actually head. It's, it's not even the It's the head that they bring. They were bringing it from Norway to Nigeria. And the ship had a big challenge in, on the sea. There was a lot of tempest raging on the sea. And the vessel was shaking. Water was splashing. The water seeped. Splash on the container, sip through the space between the door and the container, and enter into the container. The person importing that fish used carton paper. No, there's nothing wrong with carton. He could have used a laminated carton, or rather, put that stuff inside the nylon before putting it in the carton. Any form of waterproof. He didn't do that. So when the when the container, so of course, it enter, it touches the feed, the fish are rotting from. You know, it, they will start affecting each other and the rotting spread. When they opened the container in Nigeria when they arrived, it was smelling terribly. That person cannot claim insurance. He can't claim insurance because it's his fault. You should know what you are shipping and you should know this thing I'm shipping is perishable. If it's perishable, what do I need to do to ensure I preserve it in transit? It's my job. I should be able to know the risk associated with packaging my product. For example, if I'm exporting a product and the product is as oil in it, either naturally or through frying, I need to reduce the exposure of that product to air and to light because that will increase oxidation of that product and that will increase rancidity of that product and that will make the product to deteriorate. So the nature of the item I'm exporting influence the kind of packaging I put. So my recommendation is go and read about packaging requirement for your product. Coming back again to learning. Coming back again to learning. This will save you a lot of money. Go and read a lot. Now, I'll come back to a conversation we had the other time in the previous episode when we we're talking about different shipment options. You know, there was a time we were doing shipment, and this is answering one of the questions in the previous episode, which I, I didn't remember to, to put this example of reducing cost. If I want to export products by air, so let me just use this example of a shipment, our own shipment. We were shipping by air one ton of tar. We were using cartons to do the shipment. So if you know how it happened at the port, they will, I, I, I brought it in cartons, 20 in a carton, that's 10 kg per carton. They will now put it in another big carton. And they can have like two or three of such cartons. So because I'm shipping 10 kg per carton, 100 carton is one ton. 10 kg per carton, 100 carton with water because, because 10 is 100 kg, 100 carton is one ton. Now, they can be putting 100, 100 in a carton. Mm. Carton. So you now have carton upon carton. So if my product is weighing, the path I'm exporting is one ton, 1,000 kg. Plus the nylon they need to wrap the carton. 1.05 ton, 1,050 1, kg. Plus the carton, 1,350 kg. And shipment by air is based on weight. Now, I'm going to be paying for weight that will be wasted. Because those cartons are going to be discarded when they get to destination. You know what was I doing? We now replace the paper carton with nylon packaging. So that means the pack is in the nylon primary packaging. They will now put it in another nylon. You know the way they do pure water bag. That pure water bag, for those non, uh, the, uh, non Nigerian, is a water, pure water, it's a sachet, yes, sachet. That sachet, 20 of them will be in another big nylon. Now, that pure water bag, that's where we're packaging. We're not packaging in that nylon. Now, nylon has lesser weight. Suddenly, 1,350 kg. Reduced to 1,250 kg, 1,200 kg, 1,150 kg. Because, and so now we are reducing about 200 kg. And you know how much per kg sometimes can be up to 1,000 naira, 800 naira, 500 naira per kg. And you are removing 200 from that. Now, that's one of the ways you can reduce cost when you are shipping by air. And now, but this packaging now, you know, in packaging you have primary packaging. That's the material around the product, primary packaging. Secondary packaging, the material you are putting the product in. 
Now, primary packaging, the product is in contact with it. Secondary packaging, the product is not in contact. The, the, the primary packaging is in contact with the secondary packaging. It's like the nylon that I put the pack in is primary packaging. The carton I put the package pack in is secondary packaging. I can now put like 50 cartons stacked them on each other and put it on a pallet, tertiary packaging. Now, the secondary packaging, in the case of this, now the secondary packaging was what we were able to use to reduce our cost. You see that secondary packaging is critical. It can affect, if my primary carrying is good, my second carrying is bad, it's possible that picking the foot, if, if the stuff inside is fragile, and I did use a strong secondary packaging, and they stack them on each other, they will compress, and that will damage what is inside. So you need to know the nature of the item you are exporting, and do your research to know what are the kind of primary packaging I need to use, secondary packaging I need to use, depending on where I'm shipping by air or by sea, to be able to ensure the good arrive at destination. Knowing fully well that if my good is going to Europe, for example, the cold day is high. If I'm going to UAE, the heat is high. So I need to know this thing I'm using, is it going to be able to contain the cold over there or the heat if it's going the other way? So that at the end of the day, the good arrive in optimal condition and destination market. Thank you very much for joining today's episode of the podcast. We do hope that you've learned a or two from the show. And I'm going to be handing over to Dr. Manu Gage just give us a summary of all he has discussed so far. All we have discussed today basically revolve around logistics and supply management in international trade, even though we are focusing on export. Remember, I said international trade is likely a business of documentation and logistics. And that means that you must get your documentation right in order to avoid delay, demorage, and discrepancies, which can eventually make the transaction to be a loss. We also talked about different shipping options and how to choose. Should I go by air? Should I go by sea? Should I go by rail? Should I go by land? And how to and the, the, the benefit and importance of each of these and how I should go about deciding on which of the options I'm supposed to in, uh, engage for my shipment. And lastly, we also talk about how to be efficient and reduce your cost in international trade. I believe this have, we always, of course, have been of immense benefit to a number of people that are listening to us and of course we look forward to seeing you at the next time.